Skeptics. The World Skeptics Congress, Paranormal, Supernatural, Fringe Science, Pseudoscience and How It Really Is. Berlin welcomes you. Our next speaker is uh, Samantha Stein. And Samantha is uh, uh, the director and founder of the Camp Quest UK, a secular summer camp uh, promoting philosophy, critical thinking, and, uh, and uh, science uh, for young people at age uh, between 9 and 16. In 2010, she was awarded a special award from the National Secu uh, Secular Society for her work in, in this uh, Camp Quest organizations. And Samantha studied psychology at York University and religion, and religion in contempor contemporary society at King's College London, during which time she wrote her thesis on the rise of organized irreligion in the Western world. Now she will speak about engaging uh, children in science. Thank you very much for having me here at the Congress. I'm the founder of Camp Quest UK, which is a secular summer camp program for children aged 9 to 16, focusing on challenge, uh, combining challenging outdoor activities with a fun educational program that focuses on science, philosophy, and critical thinking. I am going to talk to you today a little bit about the educational philosophy behind our camps, but on a more broad basis about the state of science education in the UK. Our government is at the moment investing greatly in so-called STEM subjects, which mean science, technology, engineering, and maths. And yet industry is increasingly saying that we don't have enough high quality scientists and engineers. And many now source talent from abroad. So just to share some background information on, on science in the UK. So what's known as science is compulsory up to the age of 16, which is GCSE level. But taking science exams is not, so they don't actually have to be tested on it. Um, in, we have a, a bit of a weird system, so you can opt for a single, double or triple award. The triple award, which is what I did, um, which is generally for the, the higher achievers, um, you get a separate qualification for biology, chemistry, and physics. So I would have biology, GCSC. For the single and double award, you get a combined award. So for the single, you would get one GCSE in science. Um, and for the, my research for this talk, I had a look online to see what this science GCSE comprises. Um, through studying GCSE Science Single Award, students acquire knowledge and understanding of how science works, how it benefits mankind, and the drawbacks of science and scientific and technological advances. Now that's fair enough, if a bit sort of vague and wishy-washy, but I mean, does it strike anyone else as odd that at the age of 16, students are immediately being taught as one of the three priorities, the drawbacks of science and the drawbacks of technological advances? I don't know, maybe it's just me. So you'd think, well, youngsters have a choice. They can choose if they want to engage in science or not. But unfortunately, only one in five state schools actually offer the, the triple award. So that means that, that most children in the UK are forced into doing the double, the single award, which will not prepare them adequately for further education, A-levels, university. Furthermore, our amazing um, school system, there are two tiers of GCSEs. So there's the foundation tier and the higher tier. And if you don't think your student is going to perform very well and you're a teacher, you'd probably put them in for a foundation level. It's a shorter exam, there's less to cover, but it means that even if they ace the exam, the highest mark they can get is a C grade. Whereas if you're put in for the, um, the higher tier, you can get anywhere from A star to D, I think you can probably fail it. Um, so there is a problem of access as well as engagement, which doesn't help. Um, also science facilities are more expensive. Um, science exams are a little bit harder, so you can imagine why schools would probably not put their students in for as many science exams as humanities. Um, it, they'll, they'll opt for the easier, cheaper subjects, and it'll make their results look better, so they'll get more funding, and then they'll get go up higher in the league tables. Um, I don't know whether you have league tables in Germany, um, but basically it's a sort of ranking system, so you get a certain amount of scores, and they say, well, this school 
scored the most GCSEs and it, it gives credit to the school rather than the pupils. It's, it's, a, it's a bit weird. I think the main problem I have with GCSE science is there's, there's very low levels of numeracy required and universities are reporting that they're getting in science graduates or they're getting in students wanting to study science and they just don't have enough mathematical ability. Um, for example, I studied psychology, as you know, um, as a Bachelor of Science, which required quite a lot of statistical analysis and manipulation of data. But all that was required to get to that point was one A-level in a science subject. Now, I chose physics, which was lucky, but some people did biology, and they just didn't, they didn't know how to do the maths, and they really struggled on, on the degree course. So clearly there's a problem going all the way up the education system. Um, now, actually, I hadn't really looked in at the, the exam papers since I took them, but when I was doing a little bit of research, I was quite shocked by some of the, some of the ways in which they were, they were assessed. Um, they don't really even require much literacy to pass them. There's a lot of connect this sentence to this sentence, drawing lines together, or write the correct letter in the box, um, or write a single word or phrase. Um, so there's very little opportunity to develop a coherent, independent argument related to the topic. Um, and as Eugenie said earlier, if they're not tested on it, it doesn't get taught. So you can imagine that if you're being taught for the test, you're being taught to connect lines and write in boxes. So this, this filters up, and I think, I'm a little skeptical of the statistic I found, but apparently 12% of graduates currently leave university with a science, technology, or engineering degree, uh, which seems absurdly low, and I think in Germany it must be higher. I really hope it's higher. So why aren't British children engaging with science? Um, well, at the risk of angering a room full of scientists and science advocates, science can be really boring. Um, <laughs> yeah. I found it boring at school, and it really, really depends on how it's taught, if it's taught well, and how children are engaged with it. So let me give you an example of boring science from my childhood. So when I was at school, part of my coursework uh, was a project on osmosis. Do we have any osmosis geeks in the room? <laughs> Kylie put up her hand. Um, <laughs> All right, so we were handed our assignment, you know, they told us how to do it, and we had to go and collect the results and make little potatoes and put them in test tubes. Um, so this was GCSE biology coursework, osmosis in a potato. The aim, to investigate the effect of placing a piece of potato in a given strength of sugar solution. I'm not even kidding, this is what I did. Um, I predict that, I didn't actually write this, I found this on the internet because I was trying to, I couldn't even remember what the prediction was. I predict that as the solution becomes more concentrated, the more the cell will shrink as the water of higher concentration inside the potato cells flows down a concentration gradient into the solution which has a lower concentration of water molecules. Um, so if you think back to when you were 15, um, who here thinks they would really dig that? Yeah. Um, or if you've got children, who can imagine their children saying, yeah, we did this amazing experiment with potatoes? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I mean, this, this is the classic example of why I was completely disengaged with science at school. And I had, I had some really good teachers, but I still struggled. Um, and I think the main reason that that science is boring. I mean, this is on the syllabus. Um, children are being taught to pass boring exams. I mean, I, the, the GCSE science, you can download it. It's all on the internet, all the past papers and everything, and in every subject, so you can look at the other subjects. Um, but they're all dull as dishwasher. <laughs> yeah. Um, but if you look at the English literature papers, um, children are actually expected to, to show a reasonable amount of creativity and independent thought. Um, I came across one paper which was on the novel To Kill a Mockingbird, and I found the translation is Wer die Nachtigall stört. Did I get that right? Yeah? You know that book? Um, and the sample exam question was, what do Scout and Jem, who are the main characters, learn during the novel? And students were expected to write for 45 minutes, in full sentences, about their thoughts. Now, what if we had the same expectations in science exams? What if we asked, what does, potato, what does the potato osmosis experiment teach us about science? That's an interesting question. Well, it gets there. It's getting there. Or how can we solve this problem X in a scientific way? And we actually got children to articulate their understanding of science as a concept rather than you know, churning out this rote learning. 
And I know this seems incredibly unlikely that we'll actually reform the education system that much, but we can hope. I mean, I think that's what we're all here to do, is have a little bit of hope. Um, so I come on to, oh yeah, maybe we can make osmosis exciting. <laughs> um, that's one imaginative way of um, showing the problem. So we come on to rote learning. Um, now in the UK we have the GCSEs, which I've been talking about mostly, that's at age 16, you do it for two years, so you learn it throughout 15 and 16. We have AS levels, which you take at 17, and we have A levels, which you take at 18. All three sets of exams are necessary to get into university. So you can imagine that, that from a very, well, all through the teenage years, there's this culture of excessive memorization and rote learning, um, and very little time to develop a sense for the context in which these facts lie. And it's my personal belief that this way of teaching not only discourages a love of learning and spirit of inquiry, but impresses upon young people that a pressurized fact-cramming test style is um, sending the message that you only need to know it if it's on the test, which I got told quite a few times. And it doesn't promote understanding of the topic, especially if you have a good memory. It actually doesn't favor the intelligent people or the people who've got very good memories, because then you start to learn how to pass the test. Um, I went to a very high achieving school and a lot of our lessons were spent on how do you fool the examiners, what do the examiners want to know, not let's learn about this and let's find it exciting. Um, so just to give an example, F equals MA, I remember this from school, I'm very proud of that. Um, so can I have a show of hands who knows this equation, who's seen it before? Hands up, yeah, almost everyone. So who can remember what the symbols stand for? Just about the same, yeah. Who could draw a diagram with the letters and ex sort of explain how it works? Fewer. Um, <laughs> who of you are not physics teachers? Um, and, but finally, who would feel confident explaining it to your friend or your child? Good. Well, we are in a room full of nerds, so that's good. <laughs> but I mean, I, I think that a lot of science education is really learning for the sake of learning. To take a classic example, we all know that E equals MC squared. In a room full of nerds, how many of you would feel confident coming up here and explaining that? <laughs> well, okay. But I can assure you, every child in the country probably knows that E equals MC squared, and they've just got no idea what it means. They've learnt it, but they don't understand it. Um, it's all part of a culture of fact learning. Now, obviously, fact learning, it's, it's what you go to school for, isn't it? Especially in the sciences, where you learn facts, you learn the parts of a cell, you learn, well, I can't really remember anything else, but, you know, you learn facts. Um, but especially at a lower level, they're, they're very sort of, well, they're quite arbitrary in terms of what we think is important for them to learn. So do we think that them labeling parts of a cell is more important than learning about I don't know, cognitive dissonance or the way the brain tricks us, because that's not taught in schools, but you know, I know what the nucleus is. Um, and I know that some people in the sort of, who actually have experience in education disagree with me, um, but I, they, they think there is value in learning how to learn. So memorization for the sake of you know, practicing learning. Um, and what if you didn't have access to the internet? I mean, take a classic example is, is here, it's 12 years 50 to, to get access to the internet. I couldn't uh, use it to do my research, but I think I'm managing all right. Um, so I'm not arguing that we shouldn't be teaching children the, these, these facts. I'm not saying we shouldn't teach them parts of a cell. But, you know, I just don't think we should be testing children on their ability to remember it. Um, I think we should be testing them on their ability to understand it. And also what happens when the facts become obsolete. Um, I came up with an, a metaphor. I don't know whether it works. It's, I was thinking of how to describe this to children. And science is like a snake. So it's alive and, you know, constantly moving around and evolving. And then it sheds its skin every once in a while. And the skin represents the kind of facts that have become obsolete and fallen away. And if we're teaching facts, but we're not teaching how to understand facts or how to, you know, where to find the new, new information, um, we're basically just t teaching a bunch of dead snake skins to children. I don't know whether that really worked, but it did in my head. <laughs> um, and 
if children don't continue with education, the facts are what's going to stick with them, and, and they're not going to have the tools to, to carry on learning. Um, they're just going to remember some stuff that they taught in school, and I just don't think that's very inspiring. Um, so I have done a lot of criticizing. So, but how would you go about teaching science without making it boring or without focusing on fact memorization? You know, I don't mean to, to disparage teachers in any way. I, just, I mean, it's a legitimate question. So I will put my money where my mouth is and give you some examples of what we've done at Camp Quest UK. Um, to give a very brief history, it was founded in America in 1996 in Kentucky, which is one of the most religious states in the US. And I went over in 2007 to volunteer, and I thought it was great, so I set one up. The first one is in 2009. So I, this is the fourth year that we've been running. Um, now, each, each year we focus around a theme or topic of interest that's usually related to science in some way. So um, we've had evolution, the mind, the scientific method and humanity. Oh, sorry, I missed a bracket there. Um, so the example that I want to talk about is uh, from last year when we focused on the scientific method. And I wanted to have the children in small groups work on a science project, but I wanted them to do it the other way around from what they do in school. So rather than the teacher telling them why they're doing it and what method they should follow, and then them go away and play with bunts and burners and pipettes and broken beakers and things, um, you know, we'll send it away to our scientists. You know, we, have, we made up some imaginary scientists who would do their experiment for them. Um, so I wanted them to concentrate on answering a question in a scientific way. And it didn't actually matter what the question was. It mattered the way they went about thinking about it. So the, one of the questions I gave to one of the groups was, what swims faster, a human or a giraffe? Think about it. <laughs> So as you can imagine, the children had some extreme views on this. But I think most of them initially said, oh, human, obviously. I don't think they think giraffes can swim, but I think they can, actually. Um, so we prompted them. We said, well, are you sure? Um, hmm, not sure. No, I'm not sure. Um, how would you begin to find out if you were right? How would you begin to find that out? And as we sort of prompted them, they started questioning their own methodology. So they were thinking about, oh, oh, did, did human and giraffes like the same temperature water? Would they be comfortable swimming in the same temperature water? Should this be done in the wild or in a pool? Which one would it favor? Should, I like this one the best. Should there be an impetus to get the humans and giraffes swimming? <laughs> Some of the children thought. <laughs> <laughs> We didn't, we didn't go into the morality of this, <laughs> or the ethics. Some of the children thought that giraffes might not want to swim if there wasn't a crocodile chasing them, um, which is fair enough. And, and, and some of them also thought that swimsuits would give a humans an unfair advantage. So they stipulated that the humans must be nude. So the children asked these questions, designed their experiment, and we gave these instructions to our scientists, our scientists. Um, some of the younger ones thought we actually had scientists. <laughs> um, and they ran the experiment overnight. They managed to race humans and giraffes in a warm lake in Africa, which is what was decided in the end. And with some imaginative work on MATLAB, we gave them back their results. And we asked them to tell us what it means. And it, we, it was quite simple calculations. The, the most complicated calculation they had to do was an average, which they all knew how to do, which was good. So this is, this is just one way that we've kind of approached science from a different angle. And we actually got them to present it in a creative way, because after all, it's summer camp. Um, and so we said, you can present it in the form of a poem. You can have someone acting it out. And that was funny. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, we just, we just tried to make it fun. Um, there is another example that I have that I can take absolutely no credit for. There was a class of eight-year-olds who proved that children can do science. Um, they actually developed, ran, and published a unique scientific study on bumblebees in their area. And this paper is called Black Autumn Bees. It was published in Biology Letters. You can download it on the internet. I strongly encourage you to read it. It's hilarious. Um, but it's also awesome. Um, so I'm just going to read from an article describing this. Um, I think the organizer was called Lotto. It's so different from other science education programs where the aim is to learn facts, Lotto said. Over the course of about two months, Strudvik and Lotto got the kids thinking about what questions interested them and how they could solve these questions through puzzles or games. 
eventually they focused their question on bumblebees. If you want to ask a question of a bumblebee, you have to put yourself in the perspective of bumblebees, Lotte said. So we had a day of being bumblebees. Some of the initial questions were silly. Could bees learn to play Monopoly? What about football? But several questions, such as could bumblebees learn to associate color with heat, had been addressed in scientific papers in the last 10 years. Ultimately, the class decided to investigate whether bees could use spatial relationships between colors to figure out which flowers had sugar water in them and which didn't. The question has interesting implications for bees in the wild, the kids pointed out. If some flowers are bad or have already been sucked dry of nectar, bees should learn to avoid them, which is like a puzzle. And Strudwick says the project has completely changed the way that, that Black Autumn Primary School approaches science education and, and that the students now have a much more positive view of science than they did three years ago. And funnily enough, their, their test results have improved as well. Um, I don't know what that says, but they're well above average now. And one of, the, one of the students, Misha, who's now 10, says his view of ch science changed thanks to the bees. This is sweet. I thought science was just like maths, really boring, he said. But now I see that it's actually quite fun. When you're curious, you can just make up your own experiments so you can answer the question. Um, and just to give you an excerpt of the published journal article. People think that humans are the smartest of animals, and most people do not think about other animals as being smart, or at least that they are not as smart as humans. Knowing that other animals are as smart as us means we can appreciate them more, which could also help us to help them. And the, the whole paper's kind of written in this. It's very sweet. Now, just going back to a more critical look of science education in general, um, I wondered about the question, I think, Probably pretty much in every, well, in most schools and most countries, science equals biology, chemistry, physics, and those are the core sciences. And I was just sort of wondering, why is this? And obviously, well, the natural sciences, are they useful to know? Yes. Are they more useful to know than other kinds of sciences? Well, I don't know. It really depends what you want to get out of science education. And I don't really know the answer. I've thought about this quite a lot. Um, I'm, I'm still not sure I know the purpose of teaching other than what it currently does, which is to prepare people for the workplace. Um, so, but we have all these other kinds of sciences which are mostly overlooked in schools, although things are changing. The social sciences have been gaining a lot in popularity in the UK, but are generally quite badly taught at school and they're not even needed for a degree course. So for psychology, for example, you don't need to study psychology at school. However, as softer sciences, I actually think they can teach students more about science, simply because they're messier. They've got more things to control for, they're more, they're more difficult, they're, they're more of a puzzle, you know, and things don't work, and there's always problems. Um, and, and obviously, as a social scientist myself, I'm biased, but it kind of brings me to the point that everyone thinks their science is the best. Um, and then we have computer science, which is actually very rarely taught in schools in the UK, but ICT is taught in schools, which basically teaches children how to use software rather than create it. So it you know, teaches them for a life of work in an office rather than teaching them this is how you know, logic gates work or this is how you create an app. Although schools are starting to catch up with this, but it's, it's a very slow progress. Um, engineering, I don't think, is very widely taught in schools. Health science tends to focus on obesity and morality-focused health issues like pregnancy, STDs, and drinking or drugs. Um, but given the state of Britain today, that may not be a bad thing. Are we still number one in teen pregnancies? I don't know. Um, and astronomy, it kind of speaks for itself. Um, but obviously, if you're at school in the daytime, you can't really do observable astronomy, um, which is actually what we do at Camp Quest. We have a telescope, and then we wait until 10 or 10.30, just before bed, and we do, we do stargazing. So that's a nice thing that they can't do in schools. Um, and my purpose of kind of running through this, you all know these are sciences, um, it's, it's just to show that the breadth of what science is is, is, is given an injustice in the way that it's taught. Um, and in fact, all scientific disciplines can be used to pass on the idea of the scientific method and ways in which science advances. Um, and I think the real problem that we need to address 
in schools. I'm not really sure the best way of doing this, but children are given different teachers for each subject. And there's no one to say, well, actually, what you learn in biology is relevant to what you learn in chemistry. Maybe if you get a really good teacher, you'll be lucky. But there isn't actually anyone to kind of bring it all together and say, well, it all connects. Um, and I think that was personally, from my point of view, that was what was missing in my education. This brings me back to um, everyone kind of being a bit of a snob about their own subject. Um, <laughs> I don't think we can ever come to an agreement about what science is the most important, but as long as we're teaching about science, I think that that's, that's really the important thing. Um, so I just want to talk about another activity that we did at Camp Quest called, Is This Science? Um, this was one of the more exciting sessions we ran. Uh, it was meant to last 45 minutes, because obviously children, you think, oh, they don't have a very long attention span. And it lasted an hour and a half, and the children just kept, wanted it to keep going. And they kept discussing it in lunch. And I think, wow, what have I done? Um, why won't they shut up? Um, so what I did was I had a whiteboard, and I drew a line on it. At one end, I wrote science. At the other end, I wrote not science. And I put a l lots of different disciplines. I wrote them on index cards and gave one to each child, about 30 or something. And I said, come up and put your card where you think this lies on the science, not science continuum. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't just sort of biology, chemistry, physics. Um, we had all sorts of things. So we had psychology. We had SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. We had geography, philosophy, medicine. That was controversial. Cooking, even more controversial, um, archaeology, and law. So we had loads of different disciplines, and we, we put them up, and some of the children didn't know what some things were, and that was fine. And then I said, OK, what have I got wrong? They were desperate. They were desperate to tell me that this should be moved over here, this should be moved over here. They had so many opinions about where things should go. Eventually, we came to a sort of mutual understanding of, of where we all thought was best. But it was just, it was just really interesting the way that they sort of got really passionate about it. They thought, no, cooking is not a science. And I said, why? And they go, because it's not scientific. And I go, what does that mean? Um, and, and then one said, yes, it is a science, because you, can, you know that you can whisk three eggs and put it in a pan, and it will always make scrambled eggs. You know. <laughs> so <laughs> I mean, how can you argue with that logic? But it was great. I mean. The great thing that they learnt was that they realised that there wasn't a right or wrong answer. And I'm sure if I did the same exercise here, you know, we'd be bitching for hours. <laughs> um, so, so it comes to the, the idea that we don't know everything, and in fact, even scientists can't agree on a lot of things, and how you categorise things, what's more scientific, what is science, what is good science, what is bad science, um, and it stirred up some really interesting debates. So finally, I come to a more societal problem, the representation of science and scientists. Um, I think we could be sending a better message that we don't know everything, and actually what you learn in school isn't the truth as handed down from above, but it is the best truth that we have at the moment, well, probably five years ago, and is now filtered down into schools. Um, and teaching to the syllabus avoids discussion. So. <laughs> It avoids discussion and about educating children what, they, what we don't know, because we don't have a syllabus about what we don't know yet, do we? Um, that would be an interesting syllabus. Um, and I think there's also a misconception among children particularly that doing science is about being clever, passing exams, being a nerd, being a geek, I don't know which term is better. Um, so it brings me to a really great project that was done. Um, children draw scientists. They took a class of seventh graders, which I think are about 11, 12 in the US, um, to, to meet some real scientists doing science. And they got them to draw what they thought scientists looked like before the meeting and what they thought scientists looked like having met them. Um, are you ready for this? It's funny. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. So I don't know whether you can read it. Um, I do have the text. The first one, as written before, you can see the lab coat. I think a scientist is a very intelligent and mathematical person and very energetic because they have to stay interested in their work. A scientist looks like a person who is in their 30s to 50s, has glasses, and is somewhat balding. <laughs> Looking around the room, maybe that's true. Um, the sci Oh, and this is after. 
The scientists were smart, but not like geeks. The scientists were good with kids. They would talk to us so we could understand them, not in scientific terms. The scientists were like me when I was little. The scientists played sport, hung out with their friends, and also did not get straight A's in every subject. <laughs> Um, I think we should remind ourselves that the majority of adults might draw similar, I mean, <laughs> looking at popular culture of adults drawing scientists. <laughs> Maybe the kids aren't that stupid. Maybe they're just picking up what the adults are teaching them. So why does this all matter? Why does it even matter if some children just don't like science or they think we're all a bit geeky? Um, I think it matters because of aspiration. Um, we have somewhat of a class problem in the UK that you may know about, in that if you were born into a deprived background, you usually stay there. We don't have a lot of social mobility. And most scientists probably are from the middle to upper classes, I would say. I hope that's not too crass a generalization, but I think it, it's probably reasonably true. Um, but if children are suddenly opened up to science, and instead of at age 11 or 12 getting turned off science, they suddenly think, wow, this is awesome, and I can do it. And it doesn't matter if I fail this test or something, but I understand what science is about. And they, they want to go further, and they, they want to... Suddenly a whole, a whole group of career options open up to them, so they didn't have to do what their father or mother did. Um, so I think that's something that, that's quite important. Um, obviously, as adults who are really interested in science, we understand that it can lead to a richer life, but I don't think that message is being communicated to children. Um, I think the cool kids are listening to Rihanna at the moment, and that's not really my idea of a richer life. Um, but I think if we give science enough enthusiasm and make everything a little bit less dull, then, then children will start to see that actually I'm really getting something from knowing about this. Um, obviously, the advancement in science and technology for everyone kind of goes without saying. The more scientists you have, the more chance you have of coming up with cures and solutions to problems. Um, and respect for the scientific endeavor. Um, for example, engineer is not a protected title in the UK, meaning that I am an engineer. Um, more commonly, it is used in the context of the BT engineer who installs your phone line, or the skybox engineer who comes to set up your TV, or you could even say the nail engineer who paints your nails. But finally, I think we can all agree we want to blow their minds. Um, sometimes I see videos on YouTube, um, for example, I don't know if anyone's seen Lawrence Krauss give his talk on a universe from nothing, and every time I see him talk I just go, wow, that's amazing. Um, and, and can't we give that to our children? Um, now in the interests of uh, communication, I thought um, maybe it didn't translate blowing your mind, but that's kind of what we want to do. Um, so just to summarize, our principles, when I say our, I mean the principles that Camp Quest uses, but also my ideas for, for how, for what is interesting science and what makes it interesting. Um, oh, that one didn't come. So it's interconnected. Um, it's not just individual facts that don't make any sense. It's something that you put it all together and you think, this is my understanding of, of the world around me. It's alive and it's dead. It's alive in the sense it's constantly evolving. It's dead in the sense that you might learn something and then you find out that actually that's not true at all. Um, it's not about rote learning or passing exams. And it's open to debate and new ideas, which means that even children can come up with new ideas that can progress science. Um, it's humble, so we don't know everything yet, and it's not boring. And it's difficult at first, but I think the rewards are worth the effort. So I felt obliged to come up with some solutions to all the problems I have raised, rather than just having a moan at you. Um, so what is the solution? Um, empowering experiences during childhood, I think, can be quite significant in a child's development, whether it's something like being involved with the Bumblebee study, or going to Camp Quest, or simply just having a passionate role model, like a, you know, a parent, or a sibling, or friend, or someone. Um, I think exposure to science that isn't about memorizing, being a genius, passing tests, exposure to science outside academia, outside the stresses and pressures of this sort of fast-paced exam environment which, which children find themselves in. Um, less hoop jumping, because the hoop jumping tends to favor those with really good memories and privileged people who can afford tutors or have got really supportive parents. Um, 
better portrayal of science in the media. I think, especially with the skeptic movement, we are making a difference. I have noticed an improvement. For those in the UK, um, you'll know Brian Cox, who's been quite prominent recently on the main TV channels, um, presenting a variety of different th different things. And I know a lot of people who don't like science, but they will watch him. I think they fancy him or something. Um, but that's not such a bad thing, is it? Um, and the other solution is to completely reform the education system, but that might be a talk for another day. So thank you very much for listening. Hey, thanks for this great talk. Uh, it's absolutely amazing what you're doing, I think. Uh, ChemQuest is, is definitely a great idea, and, and uh, with most of what you said, I couldn't agree more. However, I would like to make a little comment on what you said about teaching facts. Yeah. You compared facts to this, the skin of a snake, which is uh, uh, shedded away uh, every now and then. And I'm not quite sure I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, I mean, for ChemQuest, I can see that you think like that. Because um, teaching children how to design an experiment is, of course, an amazing opportunity of, of teaching them what science really is. And I think that's exactly the core of what something like ChemQuest should be. But when I think of uh, science education at schools, I don't believe that you can really do without teaching facts. I don't believe that you can really do without memorizing. Um, I do agree with you that maybe we should keep that to a minimum, but I don't think that, that you can do without that. Because um, I think that how the way children learn is different, actually, from the way grown-ups learn. I mean, I am happy enough to have a job at which I learn a lot of things every week, and I don't sit down and memorize stuff, that's true. And so I think that uh, uh, adults sometimes have the feeling that this is how learning should work, but then we forget that to get to that level, you have to acquire a certain amount of facts that you can then connect. So learning, when it's fun, is about connecting stuff you already know, about uh, taking the pieces, bits and pieces in your head which are already there, and kind of um, passing beyond that and, and learning on your own. But I think in order to do that, you have to establish a certain amount of knowledge already uh, so that you for yourself can even start to find out what you're interested in. Mm. And I think for that, we just have to do some learning, even if it's sometimes not so exciting as we would like it to be. Yeah. No, I mean, I do agree. I think I gave a little caveat that I didn't think we should abolish it altogether. But I mean, yeah, that's a completely valid point. Um, to to kind of tie it all together requires something to tie together. Um, but I think, I think what I meant is that I don't think that facts should be the focus of an exam. I don't think that you should examine how well someone is able to memorize something. With exams, I absolutely yeah. agree. Yeah. Okay, then we're in agreement then. <laughs> Um, hello. Uh, Hi. hi. Um, I, I very, very much support Camp Quest, and, and I think there's absolutely nothing wrong with trying to make science more interesting. That, that just has to be a, a good thing. Um, but I think science is more interesting today in the school than ever before with, with the internet and, and, and fantastic videos and resources and so on. So I, I don't think that's the problem. And if we go back in time, again, this is a very UK centric uh, view. Um, but when I did A-levels, we had 50,000 people doing A-levels. Within 15 years, that number had halved. Uh, in 1993, sorry, yes, in 1993, we had um, the, the number of people who are physics graduates going into teaching dropped by 70% within seven years. Mm -hmm. So there's something, and, and so science, science was dull 20 years ago, and yet the enthusiasm for it was much greater. So I think there's something else that's the deep problem. And I think it then goes back to some of the issues you raised very briefly at the beginning. Um, things like um, mixing up the sciences. So if you're a physics graduate, I would hate having to teach biology or chemistry in the same way that biologists would resent having to teach physics, perhaps. Mm. So then people stop going into teaching. 
And, and I think the reason why all this comes about, certainly in the UK, was the desire to get more people doing science. And again, that's a good thing. Mm. Um, again, when I was at school, a lot of people were probably dropping out of science and had no qualification at all. Today, people do end up with a qualification in science, but they do not end up with a qualification in science that will take them further. Mm. So the challenge has to be, if, if, if a child has a, a passion uh, and an ability that needs to be nurtured and taken further, how do you develop a qualification which stretches that child uh, and so I, that's why I think the real emphasis should be. So I look forward to your other talk on that subject. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I suppose my my response to that would be, um, I think Kylie said that I was going to talk about it, and I didn't. Um, if you compare exam papers today and when I took them with in the 80s, they are. <laughs> This isn't just an adult saying, oh, well, they were so much easier, they're so much harder in my day. They are actually a lot easier today. And, and that could be a reason why so many more people have taken them. But yeah, I mean, they, we always dreaded doing the old past papers because they were difficult and they were boring. And, and the syllabus has found a way to make it a little bit more relevant. So they'll, they'll say, well, the application of science in society. Um, but I think the, I hate to use the words dumbing down, but I, I think that's what has happened to such an extent that it doesn't become challenging for people who are really interested in science. Okay, maybe it enables them to get the qualifications, but it doesn't actually give them anything out of that, um, which is why, I mean, those suggestions about what can we learn from the, the potato osmosis experiment, something that that is a little bit more kind of free form and enables the, the child to develop a sort of coherent thought about a particular aspect M might be an idea for that which which enables it to be sort of interesting and challenging at the same way but yeah it is a difficult problem i agree i did my uh, school exams in the 1960s and uh, i'm sure that we didn't have as many subjects on the curriculum then so you had much less choice mm. and uh, sometimes you had to do subjects that were boring um, including science uh, subjects but uh, am i right about that is that is that true there are, um, there, are there, there is much more, more competition uh, yeah i mean there are the amount of subjects has exploded in recent years um you can i don't know whether you could do pe physical education as a GCSE back then, but you know you can do you can do all sorts, and also something which I haven't really talked about at all is that a lot of subjects which were traditionally vocational subjects have now been translated into a sort of more academic sense, or or things like media studies, which I know some people really don't like, but I doubt that really existed 20 years ago even. So that there are a lot of newer GCSEs and, and newer A-levels. Um, but the problem is that universities are starting to make a distinction between these because they're thought of as easier. Um, so in some ways, schools want to push some of these on their less talented pupils because it can inflate their grades. But in, in other ways, um, universities won't accept them because they don't consider them to be sort of academic subjects. So there's a problem there. Um, personally, I'm concerned about uh, getting children to think critically. Mm. Yes. Um, well, your campus program, wonderful. But yes, I can also call it science, science camp. Mm. Do you have programs uh, on critical thinking? Because I think that the seeds of critical thinking should be sown. Mm. When you, you know, in kids or when, when people are still very young mm. and that, that can help us in our campaign and quest as skeptics and for a more scientifically oriented society. Mm. Now, could you please just take us back a bit to the, one of your slides, back, just be moving back a bit. Oops. Which slide was it? You just keep moving. <laughs> Fine. Okay. <laughs> now. Not to be taken literally. <laughs> now, there is this idea, I'm toying with it. I have, not exp I have not tested it anywhere. Now, imagine coming to a class and give children this kind of image and ask them to raise questions. Yeah. And 
evaluate them based on the number of questions they can generate. Mm. So, yes. I think that sometimes we burden children with answers. They keep looking for answers. Mm. Even when they are not informed enough. Yeah, it's okay. Try to find out some childish answers to some of these questions. But another program that can help them also is to get them to exercise you know, their critical intelligence, their curiosity, the inquisitiveness and the ability to ask questions. Mm. So that part of the program, I think, apart from what you're doing, wonderful, is also to get, you know, programs that can get uh, get children to ask questions and evaluate them and assess them based on the ability to generate questions. Thank mm. you. That's actually a really great idea, and I might steal that idea for one of our sessions at camp. Um, I'm imagining it now. Yeah. <laughs> no, thank you for that. Do you keep track of the children that you are having in the camp and how their grades are changing after being in the camp? Um, uh, yes, no, anecdotally, yes. Um, we have a really high rate of returning campers. So in this fourth year, we have about five children who were at the camp in 2009 and who've been to every camp since then. And we get, we've had a lot of people come back from last year. So we do kind of we see them year on year a lot of the time. Um, we get feedback from their parents. I don't think it's necessarily improving their grades. I think actually in a weird way, it's, it's sort of improving their confidence more. Um, a lot of the children are, well, they're interested in science, so maybe they're a little on the nerdy side. Um, that's great, we all are. Um, so, but you know, they get the impression that I'm at school, no one else is really interested in this stuff. And then they come to a camp and they realize actually it is interesting and there are loads of other people who think so. So it's, I think what we give them is more about empowerment than actually an effect on their grades per se. Um, but yeah, we do, we do keep in touch with them and we hear nice things from parents, which is always nice. Just a very quick question. Uh, I was just wondering uh, how did the children in the camp, how they are selected to be there or how do they get there? Uh, do the parents enroll them or is it a school program that gets them there? It's normally their parents who enroll them. Occasionally we get a few who say, I found your camp, I want to come to your camp. And we say, well, you kind of got to ask your parents before you before you spend their money. Um, but on the whole, it's parents. And we, f we don't really, we don't do a lot of advertising or marketing. We found that... <coughs> Parents don't want to be marketed to, they, but they want to hear it through their friend who sent their kids. Um, so that's how, how we've sort of worked so far. Um, but yeah, we, it's, we, don't, we don't really do it through schools as such. It's been an idea, though. Uh, I, I think maybe I'm wrong, but uh, I have the feeling that uh, uh, it would be parents that are already, already interested in science and already think that science is important who would select such a camp to send their children to. Do you think that's the case, or is it uh, also children from from a background that's not uh, not maybe? Yeah, um, you're absolutely right. It is on the whole parents, not dissimilar to people in this room, um, generally white middle class who are passionate about science. We have been doing our best to offer assisted places, reduced places, and some free places um, to those who wouldn't otherwise be able to afford it but it's something i mean we're in our fourth year which is when you do it once a year or twice a year it's it's, it's very much in its infancy i feel and so that is a direction that we're kind of specifically looking to go to is to target people who maybe their parents aren't very supportive of them at school but they're still interested in becoming an astronaut or something you know so that's where we're looking to go yeah coming back to the um to the question if you should teach facts or you should rather teach the method of science. I was on a counseling program last year where we tried to encourage um, um, uh, students from lower class families to go to university. And I talked to several of them and they, they told me, oh, I think science is quite interesting, but I don't really want to be a scientist because all the interesting things have already been found out. <laughs> So, and this is just this. This was not one one uh, eighteen year old saying this, but several. Yeah. So I think that's really sad. Yeah, it's definitely an attitude that I think a lot of children have. Well, not just children, adults. Okay, the last. Uh, have you thought of inviting teachers also to your camp? Because I'm thinking about you know making these experiences 
part of their regular experience, you know, in schools. And I've Do you mean to teachers, observe or? Or to participate so that, you know, their pedagogical practices yeah. can change and then they can do these kinds of activities with students on a regular basis, you know, yeah. through formal or informal you know, curricular activities. Yeah, we we have a couple of our volunteers who are teachers um, or retired teachers. Um, but we, no, I mean, that isn't another great idea. Um, we do invite guest speakers on a variety of different topics, um, but not specifically to improve them. It's more for the, the kids' benefit. But that's a really interesting idea to expand on. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much for thanks. Your Thank you very much then. <laughs> The World Skeptics Congress, Paranormal, Supernatural, Fringe Science, Pseudoscience, and How It Really Is. We're skeptically interrogating you.